What a great morning of worship. So Warner and his wife Gabby and Santi, um, they're from Costa Rica. In fact, Gabby is, if, for those of you who have been to 6-8, Gabby is actually lives, was brought up very close to Orquetas, uh, where the ranch is. And Warner actually grew up very close to Alajolita. So, um, and they're here. And surprise, they show up in our, <laughs> at our church. So it's super cool. They're actually going to come on staff uh, to start helping out uh, Barry in worship and production and stuff like that. So we're super excited to, to have them as part of the team. Uh, so if you have not said hi to them, please say hi to them after service. Um, or if you're on digital land, uh, reach out to them. I posted a picture of their family on the uh, family page this morning. Before we get started, let me, uh, let me pray. Father, you are good, and you are deserving of our glory. And this morning, Father, you know that, that the stuff that we're going to be talking about is going to glorify you in a way that, um, uh, that should just humble us. I pray, Father, that this morning that, that wherever... Wherever we're at individually, you know, I mean, we're all in different places here this morning, God. And, and as, as I speak your word this morning, I pray that you and your Holy Spirit would work in us. Open our eyes. Help us to see that you alone are worthy of glory. And that you are the one that does all the work in us and for us. We thank you, Father, and we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so this is the last Sunday on the uh, God's Promises sermon series, okay? And so we're concluding this with the new covenant, the new promise, the, the last promise, if you will. You know, what we've been doing, and in fact, last week we saw that, that the king that was promised from David's throne, that that king was going to fulfill all of the promises, right? All, everything that we had talked about previously, that king was going to make them sure. And we saw that Jesus declared himself to be that king. So we know who, and I think, I think most, of, uh, most of us understand, like, yes, it's Jesus. Obviously, that's why we're here. We're at a Christian church. It's got, the answer has to be Jesus, right? But what we're going to look at this morning is how. Not the who. How does Jesus do this? How does God do this? How does the Holy Spirit do this? And I think along this path, we're going to walk down this thing. And as we walk down it, I think we're going to see each of us kind of go, I don't know that I've really trusted in that part. There's going to be places where you're going to go, man, I've always been the one trying to do that piece of the work. I've been trying to make that part work in my life. I've been trying to solve this problem. And what we're going to see this morning is that if it was you, then you would, be, you would not be able to sing what we just sang, which is to the glory be God alone and not to us. Right? If it was you, then you would be able to say, well, I mean, I did a little bit of work. And what we're going to see this morning is that God, through and through, has done every little piece of this, and he's planned it, and he's orchestrated it, and, he's, and we're going to step through this this morning, and we're going to see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three of them working in our lives to affect what, we, what God promised at the very beginning, which was what, that we would have a relationship with him, right? And we started this whole series with God created us in the image of him. He wanted us to have this relationship, and then we just saw casualty after casualty and everything just fall off and fall away. And this, at the end today, we're going to see God is going to have a plan, and he's executing that plan to bring us back into a relationship with him. And so we're going to start in Luke chapter 22 this morning. And ironically enough, we're going to spend more time talking about the New Testament from the Old Testament uh, this morning. And so, but we're going to start in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. So what Jesus says, and this is the Last Supper, he says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So a new covenant. We haven't really been using the word covenant very much because it's a very churchy word. <laughs> um, but it, it effectively means promise. 
And that's kind of how we've been rolling through this. But what Jesus points to right here is that there is a new covenant. He's referring to something, and we're going to kind of dissect what he's referring to here. But what Jesus is saying is that the covenant is in his blood. Very weird, right? Especially for us in the 21st century, not living in a sacrificial system with a temple and all of this stuff, right? But what Jesus is saying is that he's ratifying this covenant. He's establishing it. He's signing it in his blood. So he's the guarantor of this covenant. If you would turn over to Hebrews chapter 8, the author of Hebrews in verse 6 explains it. He says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Okay, so what you have here is the author of Hebrews is saying, you guys understand there's, a, there's an old covenant, and what he's talking about is the Mosaic covenant, the law, right, that BJ preached on a couple weeks ago. And he's saying there's a new covenant, and it's a better covenant, because it's based on better promises. And what we're going to see this morning is that the better promise is that we don't have any participation in this other than faith. That God is actually going to be the one that's going to fulfill the promise to himself. So in this covenant, right, in a normal like contract covenant, there's two parties, right? And this is how we see this in the Mosaic law. It's like, hey, well, God says do this, and then we have to uphold our part, and we have to do this. Well, in this new covenant, God says we must do this, and then God makes it possible for us to do this. And we, and we, we just trust, and we have faith. That, that is what is so incredible. That's why it's a better promise. But it's interesting, right, because he actually says if the first had been faultless, what he's not, he's not saying, and the author of Hebrews isn't saying that the Mosaic law was bad, per se. In fact, we actually read in Romans that it, it actually served a very specific purpose, and BJ addressed this. In Romans chapter 7, verse 12, he says, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. And then Paul says, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good. And then listen to this last part. In order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment, commandment might become sinful beyond measure. If you have a Bible, underline that sinful beyond measure. You see, if if we can't measure our sin, then we can't solve our sin. That's what he's saying. That was the purpose of the Mosaic Law. If, If God is the only one that can measure it, God is the only one that can solve it. And that's what he's saying. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Like, this is exactly what this new covenant, these new promises are going to do because it's going to solve this problem. And then in verse 8, in Hebrews 8, 8, he says, for he finds fault with them when he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You know where that comes from? That's Jeremiah. That's what, that's what the author of Hebrews here is quoting. Because in Jeremiah, we read that there was going to be a new covenant. Way back, right? Before they were, as, as they were going into exile, Jeremiah is saying there is going to be a new promise. There's going to be a new promise, and it's going to be on better things. And what we're going to see this morning is that Ezekiel is going to lay this out. He's going to go, let me explain to you what this new covenant is going to look like. That we know who who the king is. We know it's Jesus. Let me explain to you how he is going to affect this. So we're going to spend the rest of the morning in Ezekiel chapter 36. So if you would turn over to there, and we're going to start in verse 23, or 22, and we're going to work our way through verse 28. And Ezekiel is going to step through what Jeremiah has prophesied about. He's going to step through this new covenant. And we're going to see what this new covenant does. The first thing this new covenant does is it vindicates 
God's name. Vindicates his name. Read with me verse 22 in Ezekiel 36. He says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. See, if we're not careful, we start to think that this whole thing is about us. If we're not careful, when we read through this, we're thinking, man, God, what do you have for me today? What's, what's the thing that you need from me? And what, what kind of great words do you want to speak into my life today? And if we're not redirecting that around to say, for your glory, then we're missing the point. Because what God says here is that he is vindicating his name. He is making himself holy. And what's the reason for it? The reason is because Israel, right? And we already talked about this in Abraham's blessing. Guess, who, guess who's incorporated in this definition of Israel here? This is all of us. And what does he say? Because you have profaned my name. And what have, what have we done? Actually, he actually starts off and he says, the nations have profaned my name. When he, says, when he uses the word nations, he's talking about non-believers, people who don't trust in God. He's saying, they profane my name. Why? Because we profane his name. And we, and we see that, don't we? We live lives, we, we speak about love but it stops with our words often. We see oppression and we see the plight of others, but we just can't help but bring ourselves to care. Maybe we have a little bit of empathy, but the world sees that it's just words. And, and this is why the world looks at the church, and especially right now, and looks at the church and goes, they got nothing. They don't have anything that we don't have. They're struggling with the same things we're struggling with. They have no significant peace or joy or contentment that's lasting. God is profaned because they go, their God has done nothing for them. And as you read through the Old Testament, you see that this is God's focus throughout the Old Testament, right? That Israel is going out and living faithless lives. And what God wants to do is to show the world, show all of humanity how powerful he is, but he needs people to be obedient. He needs people to be trusting of him. He needs people to be living lives that are seeking to glorify him and not themselves. You see, and so he starts off and he, he makes it very clear. This whole thing is for God's glory. All of it. And if that, if that hurts inside of you, if you're like, man, that just seems really selfish. I don't know if I want to worship a God like that. That's because you misunderstand what glory looks like in the context of the creator of the universe. If God was for other something else's glory, then that something else would be God. You guys understand that, right? There's, there's a theological leap here that you have to take, and you have to go, you got to realize that God seeking glory has nothing to do with the same thing where you see people seeking glory. That's a different thing. That's self-absorption. That's selfishness. That's pride. That's not what God has. And so he says, at the very outset of this covenant, just know that this is so that I will redeem my name. And so the nations, the world, you, everybody will know how powerful and how awesome I am and how different I am from my creation. And what he's going to show us is that fundamentally the thing that he's going to do is he's going to show that he's going to rescue us. He's going to do it. He's going to do the rescuing. That's how God is going to glorify himself. That is how God is going to vindicate his name, by rescuing us. Look what it says in verse 24. 
I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Now, we, we saw the land blessing before, right? That, like, God was going to bless Abraham, and he's, he's continued to emphasize this. I don't want you to, like, let's not get into the Palestine-Israel debate. Like, that, that, again, is not the ultimate focus. What he's talking about here is peace, comfort, security, and this is eternal that he's promising. But those words... Look at what he says. He says, I will take you from the nations. He's going to take us. So the nations are, like I said, non-believers. He's going to take us from that, separating the wheat from the chaff. He is going to take, and then he's going to gather us from the peoples. He's, he's going to gather us from all the world. There's, there is no part of the world that God can't reach. His power is all-encompassing. And so we know that God is going to rescue us. Those who trust in him. Those who have faith in him. So how, how does this res rescue story start? If you turn over to Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Talking about Jesus, it says, Who gave himself for our sins to deliver, some of your translations might say rescue, to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. It is, it's Jesus that does the rescuing. So God wants to vindicate his name, and so he sends his son in the fullness of time, in the lineage of David, to solidify the promises that he has made previously. He sends his son, and his son is on a rescue mission. His son is coming to rescue us. He came to rescue us, and he will come again. But how? See, I think right there, most Christians, most of us are like, isn't that it? <laughs> Jesus came to rescue us. I'm not exactly sure what happens after that. But he's going to say exactly how it's going to happen. And look at this. The first part of this is in verse 25, that, that he's actually going to cleanse us us. He's going to cleanse us. Look at what it says in verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. He's sprinkling water, okay? This isn't a bath, okay? He's not talking about us being dirty. He's, the uncleanness is not due to filth and not taking a shower or a bath that has nothing to do with this. This is symbolic. And we could go back and look at the Old Testament and the idea of sprinkling and how significant that was, but it was symbolic of something deep and substantial. And what he's saying here is, I will sprinkle clean water on you. I will cleanse you from your uncleannesses. Don't we try to do that ourselves? I think, this is, I think this is the top part in our lives where we try to do what is God's responsibility. How many of you are struggling with some form of idolatry or envy or lust or addiction? The, the list goes on and on. And what do you think? I got to kick this. I gotta solve this. Isn't that what we think? That it's our responsibility to solve this problem, but that's not what it says. It says that God is going to cleanse us. You guys, fundamentally, we gotta realize that this rescue mission starts with God, and it's gonna end with God. And so your most effective measure at solving these problems is to go to God, to fall on your knees before Jesus Christ and go, help me, because only you can sprinkle clean water on me. Only you can remove the sin, the uncleannesses in my life. And we read this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. You see, Jesus' blood signed the bottom of the covenant, but it did more than that. 
See, when Ezekiel's talking about this water cleansing us, it's the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that is doing the cleansing. That's where our sins are left. And that's why we say this is, this is holy Jesus. There's nothing you can do. Right? Our sins are beyond measure. If you spent the rest of your life trying to pay, I don't know, repent or pay, pay for your sins, you would never finish. And yet Jesus, in a single moment, cleansed us from all unrighteousness, took all of our sins, past, present, and future, and in the Father's presence, we are declared righteous? You just get that. You didn't do that. You can't do that. So when we say, yeah, I believe that Jesus rescues us, when we even say that I believe that Jesus died on the cross, we're not talking about just some factual thing that happened in history. We're talking about what's the significance, what's the spiritual element of this What's the cleansing that actually happened? And what actually happened was that Jesus cleansed us from all our uncleannesses, just like Ezekiel prophesied was going to happen. He's the king that's going to make us work. But we're still not at the end of this promise. <laughs> so Jesus came, came to rescue us. Not only did he come to rescue us, but he cleansed us, cleansed us. He took away all of our sins. Isn't that done? Aren't we... Isn't this the end of the story? He gives us a new heart. Because it says in verse 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We need a heart transplant. So here's, here's the crazy thing, right? So we look at Jesus dying for us on the cross. We're like, that's incredible. He took away all my sins. Anybody else in here still sin? <laughs> yeah, BJ. <laughs> um, the only one that's willing to raise his hand. No, I'm just joking. Um, right? And so, right, we are all still struggling with sin. Why? Because our hearts are so rotten. They're bad. He compares, it, he compares a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. What he's saying is that you don't even know when you sin, that's how bad it is. True? Takes a little bit of time, and then you're like, ah, that was bad. Maybe, it, might it be that you've lived as a Christian for 10, 20 years, and then God reveals some sin in your life, and you're like, well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> how did I live so long? with this sin. You see, our hearts are stone. We don't feel it. We're desensitized to it. Our hearts don't even recognize when we're committing sin. They don't, it, it, it takes us so long to even realize. And so what, what God is saying here is, I'm going to give you a heart transplant. I need to give you a whole new heart. We can't do that on our own. Another thing that we can't do on our own. And so this is exactly what God says. is like, I'm going to give you a new heart. What's the characteristic of this new heart? Sinlessness? No. No, in fact, you're still going to sin. <laughs> so what's the new heart? What's this heart of flesh? It's a heart of repentance. It's a heart that wants the things of God. It's a heart that can sing, not to my name, but to your name be the glory. That's, that's what this heart does. The heart says, man, I'm sorry, God. You see, all of us are given a fork in the road every time we become aware of a sin in our lives. We either have a choice. We can either go this way, and we can repent. And we can say, I'm, my life is about your glory, God, and not my own. Or we can go this way and we can say, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. See, one of those, one of those is the path that leads to righteousness. One of those is repentance. One of those is when we're walking in the light like John talked about. The other is willful rebellion against our creator. 
And that's what the new heart does. The new heart gives us the ability to see our sin. Does that mean we're going to be perfect? No, not at all. But there's another step. There's another thing that God is going to do. So, so not only has he rescued us, not only has he taken away all of our sins, then he gives us a heart transplant so that we can identify the sins in our life. But doesn't that just create a bunch of frustration now? <laughs> Great, now I know all the sins that I can't control. Again, very similar to the Mosaic Law. God goes, so your response is to fall on your knees and to humble yourself before me, right? But then look at this last part. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Look at verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. We've, we've read that before. The spirit. The spirit is going to cause us, cause us. You get this? It's the power behind our lives. Not your power, not my power, not our ability to, to try harder, think harder, be better people. That's not the point. What he's saying is that his Holy Spirit is going to cause us to walk in his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. You see, that's a desire thing, right? Being careful, caring about what God says. How do you know what God says? How do you know what God wants in your life? Read scripture, pray, seek his will. He's faithful. He wants you to obey. Why? Why does he want you to obey? Because the world is profaning his name because we live no differently than they do and then we judge them. See, what he wants is us to live to be separate. Remember, we talked about this before, that this, this word holy, sanctified, means to be set apart. God wants to set his children apart. The world should see us differently. Because when the world sees us differently, then they go, what's different? Why? Why did they respond differently? Not because you're some great person, but because God's spirit dwells inside of you. And it causes you to want to live for him. He causes you to want to glorify him. The very first psalm says this in, in just an incredible way. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. That's how we become obedient. That's how we start living and allowing the Holy Spirit to live in our lives. That's how God intends to set us apart. Not because of you, not because of me, not because we're good people. We're not trying to earn God's favor. Anywhere in this plan sound like, like we can do anything to help ourselves along this path? There's nothing we can do except trust in God. Trust in this plan. Trust in his son. That's what's so incredible about it. This is why this is a new promise. This is why it's a new covenant. This is why it's built on better promises because God is not just the one establishing the covenant. God is the one signing the covenant and fulfilling all the terms of the agreement on our behalf. <laughs> that's the good news. When we talk about like the good news of Jesus Christ, when we talk about the gospel, that's the gospel in a nutshell. We've seen this start at the very beginning. And God wraps it all the way back around. He goes, do you understand that the plan all along is that I would restore this relationship? And that's the last thing that he says here in verse 28. Ezekiel 36, 28. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. That's the end. That's the end of it. That's the end that we're, we're waiting for, finally. Finally completely but there's something right now for us 
It's not that we just have to wait and hope for this time. The Holy Spirit that God sent to be with us, the counselor that Jesus talks about, that he says, hey, I got to leave so that I can send you the Holy Spirit. That counselor is with us now, here, right now, in you, in each of us, in all of God's children, so that we can live lives that glorify him. Not so we can just wait for eternity, but so that we can be about our Father's business. And so he gives us his Holy Spirit. He changes our heart completely. He cleanses us from all of our sins. You guys, like, this is amazing. This should bring us to our knees going, I can't believe that this is what existence is about. This is what our God has done. And so if, if you right now are struggling with your sin or you're struggling trying to earn it or to feel it or to, there's nothing you can do except fall before the cross. Go before God and say, God, listen, I, I, I don't know how to respond. He doesn't want you to respond to your sin in shame. He wants you to respond to your sin by going to him and saying, God, would you take this from me? Show me your power. Show me what you can do. And so many of you have stories of God's power in your life because he wants to do this. Why? Because it vindicates his name. Because our God will receive all the glory. Let me pray.